Hello, everyone, and welcome to a brand new season of Boss Talks, a series featuring candid career conversations with people who are changing the game in their respective industries. Today's episode centers on something I am incredibly passionate about, and that's embracing the career path less traveled. And what I mean by that is not everyone goes the traditional route from high school to college or from college directly into the workforce or even to college at all. There's more than one path to success, and that's a good thing. So to help me explore this topic, I've invited Michael Ellison, founder and CEO of CodePath, CodePath is redesigning college programs to help underrepresented students land coveted jobs. Michael, welcome to Boss Docs. Oh, thanks. Thanks for having me. I'm excited too. (laughs) Now, you have such a unique background, and I want to give everyone a chance to get to know you just a little bit better. Can you take us back to the early days of growing up with a single mom, to your experience in school, and then eventually getting into tech? Uh, Yeah, well, you know, uh, I was uh, low income, role main. Uh, When I was Five years old, my father was incarcerated. Uh, my parents split up. Uh, we became homeless for a time, and um, it was, uh, you know, the type of situation you wear the same clothes every day. You're going to school. Uh, you know, we we do pop tarts. Sometimes I talk about as pop tart poor pop tarts for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, or you know, I think um, the thing that was most challenging was maybe sometimes you have good teachers, sometimes you don't. Uh, you know, I I um, I was a fairly good student. Uh, you know, despite everything. Got into college, uh, was excited about majoring in computer science uh, because people told me it might be something I could be good at. Uh, and um, un- unfortunately, I, I just didn't feel prepared. But I was uh, also a pretty ambitious young person. I didn't want my past to predict my future. And so I started a first nonprofit when I was 19 years old. And then I started two additional nonprofits and then three tech companies, including one that was acquired for a little over $3 billion just last year. So, you know, my, my experience, I think it's, it's proof that it doesn't really matter where you start. It's about where you finish. That really matters. And uh, that's what is the reason why CodePath exists. Uh, you know, I don't want to hear stories about how if you're an underrepresented minority in tech that has made it and been successful, you had to get lucky. Instead, we want to redesign the pathway so that by default, underrepresented minorities and people from low income Uh, first generation backgrounds are able to reach their full potential and feel like there's a place for them to thrive in tech and, you know, any top industry. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us, Michael. I would love to hear your advice for those on a similar non-traditional path who are trying to get their foot in the door. What advice do you have for them? So I I have four key pieces that I think about in the order that I'd recommend. One is to start with your own psychology. Start with yourself, invest in yourself. What are the daily weekly habits that you're doing that help to build your confidence? What are the stories that you're telling yourself? Uh, There's different exercises I like a lot. Like I like to do a uh, morning meditation. I like to do write um, a gratitude exercise, a daily gratitude of what I'm grateful for. I think also very important is to uh, reprogram how you think about past. You know, sometimes a lot of people can be very self-critical. So uh, I, I do this acknowledgement exercise and I say, I give myself credit for things I did well you know, the day before. And there's a way of reprogramming yourself. I think it starts there with your psychology, how you're treating yourself, how you're helping to be prepare yourself to do something really hard. And then I think this next step, number two, is about community. Uh, find mentors, find teachers, find peers. It's like if you're going to the gym, you're more likely to stick if you have your gym buddy. So uh, that's incredibly important, that community piece, like how you're going to sit, how you're going to keep going for this big change that you want to make, you know, find people who are also trying to uh, be on this journey with you. Uh, And then, you know, number three, uh, you know, skills, technology is hard, especially trying to get to the level that's going to give you the upper mobility you want. And so um, you want to, there's lots of great programs um, out there. I'll I'll mention Trailhead is, you know, one program, one opportunity to uh, get get some of the skills. And then uh, I'd say, you know, there's a last piece where you can have the skills, but you don't have the opportunity. Uh, you know, you're still invisible to employers. So that last part of after you have the skills, you put in the time, you put in the work, you have the community, be aggressive as you possibly can to connect with people who are already in the door at the places that you want to go to. You'll be shocked by how friendly and supportive people will be that you've never met if you just share your story. I really want to get tactical about what people need to do to get a job in tech. 
or really in any industry, especially if you're not coming through traditional pipelines with that four-year degree. So what are the courses or programs you'd recommend or even organizations or groups you recommend people join? I'm very biased in favor of uh, free educational opportunities because there's so many uh, fantastic opportunities. Um, you know, anything from like, a, you know, a free code camp. I did mention Trailhead earlier, so I want to sing, you know, your praises as well. Um, you know, of course, CodePath, we're completely free um, and teach thousands and thousands of, of students as well. Uh, I want to uh, give a shout out to uh, Career Karma because I mentioned uh, Career Karma is a uh, tech startup that they're really focused on just community from a coding standpoint, and they they don't charge anything as being part of this community. So I I, I love uh, the programs that are going to get you connected and um, meet with peers uh, and and have that you know have that positivity from from day one to help you to keep going. Uh, you know. Practically speaking, though, I just to be real, like you, you have to, you have to be. I mentioned aggressive earlier, but I'll give you an example from like early in my career. So, um, started that nonprofit and I was nineteen, didn't know anyone, didn't have any connections. We literally Googled how do you raise money on Google. That was that was our plan. That was our strategy. Googled that, and then we um, we heard that you know Goldman Sachs has a lot of money. So we're like, all right, we're going to call Goldman Sachs. I was dialing on the phone. I'm like. Hey, my name is Michael Ellison. I'm calling from, and you know, we were dialing the dial number is like, you know, olden days a little bit, dialing the, the dial number. And we eventually just got to some random VP that was confused, gave, gave us tickets to a conference that we weren't supposed to have. And then I end up pitching the chairman of the board at Goldman Sachs at the event I'm not supposed to go to because I pretend that I have a ticket. So I, when I talk about aggressive, I'm talking about like find a way to get into the room. Find a way to, I mean, you're going to embarrass yourself, but you have to like go anyways. I also see, you know, meetups. Oh my gosh. Like I see so many people that come to Silicon Valley, they just show up at a meetup and there's all these engineers and there's like angel investors. So there are all these people who are there. And I see people go from not knowing anyone to suddenly there's a community and there's support. So, uh, you know, I, I think uh, learning, uh, commitment, there is an emotional connection you need to have. Start there. And then, you know, wherever your community, wherever your tribe is bringing you, you know, follow them and, and, and make sure you surround yourself with people who are the most talented people you can possibly find. That's right. I love, I love that. You got to sharpen your elbows a little bit sometimes to get on in there and pry that door open. So now you've got your foot in the door. Then what? You know, getting a job is really the first step. Then the work becomes about advancing people in leadership roles or potentially founding your own company. Can you share more about your, your perspective on this? I know you have one. <laughs> well, one thing I've been pretty good at is um, distinguishing different types of supporters and being very intentional. So I think of mentors and sponsors and champions. I think of those three different types. And I think of the people who are my mentors as they're giving me advice. They're giving me the pointers. I'm regularly checking in with them. I think of the people who are the champions who are they're singing my praises. They're they're doing different introductions. And then I think of the sponsors. And these are people who you're you're in your role. They're like, hey, I'm going to put you here so that you get that promotion. I'm going to. You're an entrepreneur. I, I'm the one who's going to give you that deal. I'm like, how much? 200 k recurring contract. Great. I'm the one. You need to have all three of these and you need to be very intentional. You don't need one. You need an army of all of them. And if you're in an organization or you're starting a startup or whatever, build your army of supporters and don't just think of them in terms of like, you know, uh, I need their advice. I need, uh, they're, they're my mentor or whatever. Think of them as like, we're going to collaborate. Um, I'm going to add value as well with every interaction. This audience knows I have a bone to pick about the pipeline issue in tech. And for those less familiar, I'm referring to the fact that um, Black workers make up only 2 to 6% of the workforce at a lot of tech companies. But Michael, I love your optimism and how you say that if the pipeline doesn't exist, we simply need to rebuild it. So what are things we can do to help create it? Uh, what gives me optimism is that I see if companies invest more in rebuilding the pipeline, it seems to be an unfair com a competitive advantage from a talent standpoint. Uh, and what I'm talking about is, um, you know, um, some of the organizations that we've worked with that have invested heavily in early career programs or programs where um, are helping to train 
based on the technologies that the companies are focused on, uh, they've seen that if they do an effective enough job of designing that end-to-end -end program, providing the right support in the right way, then now they have this captive audience that is extremely biased in their favor. So, you know, getting people to the level where they'll be able to um, be, be talented, be a good fit for your workforce, but then also uh, from a, you know, it, it's a competitive war on talent, so being able to compete. But, you know, it comes with meeting those individuals part way, give them an opportunity to be able to prove that they are as exceptional as they are. And, you know, people will surprise That's you. Right. And that grit and determination is what so many companies are looking for in their ideal worker. So it's, it's really a win-win for both when we can make that happen. I want to zoom out and talk about the impact on a bigger scale. How does welcoming untapped talent help companies and our broader society begin to address deeper systemic issues of racial equality and inclusion? And I understand this is like a really big topic, so we might even need a part two to this, but wh what are your thoughts on it? Oh, I actually, I, I think this is like a really clear cut. I, I think uh, in a way, I you know, uh, when I think of racial equity, I think of companies talking about racial equity, then there's one question I'm like, are you creating pathways to power and influence? For marginalized communities, are you are you doing that? Are you creating those pathways? Because if inside of your company you're creating these pathways for upward mobility, uh, if you're creating the inroads into your company, then the way that you're going to change the culture and the way that you're going to change uh, it to be a more inclusive workspace is by having these people from underrepresented communities and disadvantaged backgrounds have the pathway to be in the decision making seat you know, from the board, you know, to different executive team to whatever, these pathways are critical. And so I would, I would say, you know, letting in this untapped talent is the recipe for you changing the leadership and the dynamics and for middle management and, and whatnot. And the better an organization is at doing this, the faster they're going to transform things, they're going to transform what the status quo looks like. So I'm completely all about um, this untapped talent is going to be your tool and your opportunity to change your culture from within. Michael, I get this question a lot from friends and family and on my LinkedIn where people just, they want to be in tech, they want to start coding, and they just don't know where to start or if it's even too late. Do you ever think it's too late to pursue a new path or to get started in, in tech? No way. The tech industry reinvents itself like every five years. Every time you hear a new buzzword, a new technology, you hear about blockchain, you hear about what like what Mark Zuckerberg said something about the metaverse recently, metaverse. So every time you hear a new buzzword, that means that there's a new opportunity for uh, learning. Uh, skills quickly go out of date in, in tech, which is a bad thing, but it's a great opportunity for those that are brand new because it means a new technology comes along and you just dive into that and then you can start to become part of that in group, that Illuminati, those people who actually know what they're talking about and what they're doing. So it's definitely not too old and especially want to impress that there is a world of different opportunities. There's a, you know, I'm, uh, I'm more artistic. I'm, I really care about um, if you look at the impact tech has had on culture, on movies, on music. There are so many different areas that you could be very excited about that you might not even know exist. You might be like, oh, I'm not a coder. It's this one thing. No, no, no. There's so many different types of programmers out there. So um, I, I think anyone could find an area that they would probably at least be a little bit excited about. I know our Boss Talks audience is going to love that. I know there are probably some people out there going, ah, oh, thank goodness it's not too late. And I just love your your optimism about it. And I think it's real. You know, there, there's so many opportunities available. So, Michael, we've been talking a lot about tech today. Do you think the same ideas apply to all industries? Uh, 100%. 100%. The way things happen, I'm thinking about my, my second startup company, where I was actually still pretty young. I was still in, in school. And it's um, I was trying to figure out what to do. I didn't know what I wanted to do. Uh, I was just like, I need to do something. I, I did this nonprofit. What's going to be this thing, which somehow gives me a way to have the, the leg up or to, to stand out or to, to get ahead or what, what can I do? And um, I actually found somebody, my, my brother was following on Twitter, uh, who was really interesting. He had um, been uh, head of corporate social responsibility for Nike. He started MTV's pro social 
programming, won multiple Emmy Awards, was head of talent for the Obama campaign. There's all this stuff. I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. The intersection of all these things. And um, so I reached out to him on Twitter. Um, it was kind of annoying. And, and then he eventually was like, yeah, sure. I'll meet with you. I'm, you know, I'm heading to Boston um, and we can grab dinner or something. And so I met with him. I'm like, this is my shot. And so we had dinner and I pitched him like, and he's like, he's like, cute, cute experience with your nonprofit. Like, sounds great. Look, um, I don't need you. I don't even know what you would do. You don't have any skills. I mean, you're kind of early in your career. And he kind of left at that. He was like, okay, I'm going back to New York. He goes back to New York. And then for the next month, I just start working for him without his permission. <laughs> so I just, I, I'm like, I'm like, let's see, he, he's busy. He doesn't have time. What things could I do that he doesn't have time for? I'm like, I'll, I'll do some research for him. I, hey, I, I think I heard he was meeting with this company. I'll just kind of anticipate something that he might need to be done. So he's like, stop, you're annoying. What are you doing? Stop it. <laughs> I'm not going to work with you. <laughs> but after a month, he was like, okay, fine. I'll invite you to some meeting to take notes, but I don't really need you. It's just that, you know, that seems like it could be useful. So he invites me to the meeting. And in the meeting, there's, uh, th this is the, the tech intersection. There's a bunch of developers that are um, on the call. They hired at this design firm. And um, I just ended up like taking notes and organizing things. And then he kind of realized that he hated to do something that I actually like to do. And that gave me my in. And then after a couple more weeks of working with him, he's like, okay, you're kind of valuable. Move to New York. You can be my partner. And, um, and then kind of the rest was history. But all of that was a non-technical thing. That was just like, how do I figure out how to add value and how do I get my foot in the door? So, you know, I, I think it, the, the hustle, the intentionality, um, the figuring out where you can leverage what you already can do is extremely important. I, I could not agree more. I tell um, the folks I mentor all the time, like find the gaps, find the thing that your boss doesn't want to do. You will always have a job. <laughs> if you Be figure useful. Out what those <laughs> things are. Be useful and get yeah. in there. I think that's such great advice. Thanks yeah. for sharing that story. So my final question, and this is my favorite question because we ask it of all of our guests. Michael, what is your superpower? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I think, I think I'm, I just, uh, I'm very authentic. Like it's hard for me to, uh, not just be myself, my personality, my, this, my passion. And I think that leads to trust, uh, with lots of different parties and, and trust, I think is one of the most important things that you can have, or you can be good at, at that you can leverage, uh, say you have a big idea and the right people trust you. I mean, you can literally just change the world. What's the difference between raising $5,000 or raising $5 million? It's those people trusting you. You know, what about someone influential lending their name to your cause? Game changing, but they have to trust you. They have to be like, okay, well, that's like, I will do that for you. Um, or even, you know, uh, you know, nowadays talking with billion dollar companies to try to convince them to do something they haven't done in the past. Well, if they trust us, they're like, yeah, it's a crazy thing, but yeah, I, th I, th I think you can do it. Then it's, you can just move mountains. So I, I think of uh, that authenticity as the core and then uh, resulting in trust, like over the long term. you know, hey, we're gonna be there next year. We're gonna be there the year after. Uh, look at where we were, look at where we're going. Uh, I think that I consider that my superpower. Yeah, you definitely nailed that one. <laughs> Michael, <laughs> thank you so much for being so open and authentic about your personal experience and then the experiences of your students. It's really delightful to hear. The path to success is not always linear. And I know this helps all of us understand and really appreciate that. So thank you for joining us today. Oh, thank you. I know this is a popular topic with all of you, so let's hear your questions. It's my understanding that you need one internship, often multiple internships actually, to break into the professional world. Is that the case? Hi, Max. Great question. I am a huge fan of internships and apprenticeships. And as a hiring manager, I can tell you that seeing an internship on a resume is so valuable. It lets me know that you spent time in a corporate environment, time developing what I like to call workplace survival skills, skills like communicating with colleagues and executives, networking, critical thinking, 
or just keeping up in a fast paced environment. These skills are so important. Now, can you break into the professional world without an internship? Yes, absolutely. But having that experience is not only beneficial to the hiring manager, it's also helpful to the intern. Nothing helps validate your skills or makes you feel confident in your career path of choice like real world experience. So if you can get it, take it. I hope you all enjoyed today's conversation. For more Boss Talks, be sure to check back here on Salesforce Plus so you never miss an episode. And to continue boss building, head on over to trailblazer.salesforce.com to join millions of trailblazers who are learning relevant skills and giving back with the Trailblazer community. With that, thank you for tuning in to Boss Talks and see you all next time. Say hello.